for attending today's event. As we are about to begin, we would like to invite all members of the audience to please take your seats. Those of you who would like to come in front, we are not going to bite. We'd more than welcome you to come in front. And of course, we would like to implore later when we have the Q&A session, you are more than welcome to interrogate our uh, guest and get as much knowledge as you can from our speaker here today. Now, once again, let me wish you a salam sejahtera and a very good morning. My name is Vishal J. Singh, and I'll be your master of ceremonies for today. And on behalf of the organizers here at PAM, it is my honor to welcome all of you to today's seminar. We truly are very happy to see so many beautiful faces here on this bright Saturday morning, and we are counting on you to make the session just as lively as our speaker will. Now, without wasting time, allow me to read some of the housekeeping notes for today. Should the unfortunate need arise to evacuate the building, please use the exits nearest to you, in which case the staircase, of course, is at the back of the hall and towards my right at that corner over there. Okay? Now, you will be all the instructions given by the fire wardens if that need arises, and of course, remember to avoid using the lifts. Now, this is really important, huh? and I really hope you're going to give me a word you will do this. Please, please, please kindly switch off all phones or at least have them on silent and vibrate as to not to interrupt our speaker when his presentation is happening. In fact, it is actually better to simply switch them off so that we can give, you the, we can give them the full attention that they need throughout the event. Now, unfortunately, wearing of face masks is still compulsory during the seminar. So as long as you are in the hall, please ensure that you are wearing your face masks at all times. Now, if suddenly you are unwell, we will kindly advise you to exit the hall and not to attend as a courtesy to the other members who are here at the moment. And of course, do let us know in case we need to take the appropriate action. Now, for this particular event, only hot drinks, hot cooked food, and packed food will be served at the seminar. There is no open buffet at this event, and uh, we will let you know when the buffet actually starts. Now, we would like to take this moment, this important moment, of course, to thank our very important sponsors for today, Sika, for sponsoring today's seminar. Please allow me to invite our sponsor, Mr. Ruben Reeves, Head Key Specifier Management and BDFM in Indian Refurbishment, Sika Asia Pacific Management, to the stage to present the product talk. So, can we please have our first speaker of the day? And let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Hello? Is it working now? Ah, good morning, everybody. Firstly, uh, thank you so much for coming along on a Saturday. I know that uh, there's probably a lot of comfy sofas and children's uh, play dates that you could be at instead of uh, watching me. Uh, as you can see in the photo, that was taken a little bit before I got my glasses. Uh, I'm from New Zealand, uh, so any questions you have about uh, cuisine from New Zealand, feel free to ask at any time. Oh, cool. Am I allowed? Thank you. For the whole time? That's okay? Okay. Cool. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, opening opening up our presence and allowing you to see what else we can support you with for your uh, for your projects and for the journey of those projects. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues at Sika Malaysia for arranging this and giving us the opportunity to, to stand in front of you and, and share. Uh, so I'll just sneak straight into it. A quick intro. Like I said, my name is Ruben, but I'm also part of a, a regional team here in, um, in Singapore, working for the regional management office, as well as a sm I'm a member of a small team of, um, in within Seeker that work with key specifiers, key owners, and uh, large-scale contractors that work internationally on key projects. So the goal is to have high-level engagement and support their desires and their ambitions wherever they go around the world to have replicatability and repeatability for their, um, for their projects. So I'll give you a brief on that today. So welcome aboard. Before I get too much further, uh, please, if you see something up here and you want to ask a question or you have a comment, it's a nice open session. This is really for you. So don't be scared to put your hand up or make a noise, jump up and down, or just yell it out, and we can address it straight away. Not a problem. Um, I see in the... 
in the program that had 15 minutes of product uh, presentation. I've actually tacked that on into the second part of the presentation or the second talk today in the concrete concrete structures part. Uh, so I'll just start at the start and we'll just work our way through from there. So what do we do? Seeker. Hopefully everybody has heard of Seeker before. If not, we're a Swiss-owned multinational company, over 101 countries around the world and a 27,000 strong team. We have production in over 300 plants around the world and sales in excess of 9.25 billion Swiss franc and a prof profit of a, uh, EBIT of around 900 million. Uh, you see a little bit down the bottom there about we are there. Our products are not always seen, but we are always there in projects. So you would be hard pressed to find a sizable construction project that does not have a seeker product or a vehicle that does not have a seeker product or a house that does not have a seeker product in it, but it's not always seen. Um, with an acquisition of uh, the MBCC group globally, uh, currently in process, this will make Seeker the largest uh, construction chemicals supplier in the world. So in 2000, we moved into structural glazing, which for those that are working in fenestration will understand what structural glazing is about making our, um, our nice facades part of the structure and making a nice skeleton that can hold itself together. Also with the, with the um, admixtures that Seeker Business is, is part of, it gives us the opportunity to have ultra-high performance concrete, self-compacting concrete, for high-rise high uh, superstructures as well. Moving into the future, we see that there's going to be heavy, even more demand for modular or PPVC construction to keep up with the rapid growth in populations for, for mega cities. And part of that will probably encompass some 3D concrete printing uh, at, at various stages. And I've got a, a few slides in the second session today to show you where Seeker is and where we see the market is with 3D concrete printing and a few examples so that you can see if it's if it's something that you'd like to like to have a look at. And lastly, carbon capture as part of our sustainable, sustainable journey for a global company. We have uh, this new technology for uh, construction and demolition waste recycling of concrete where we can extract the aggregate and the reinforcement from existing demolition concrete and put them back into new concrete as well as uh, capturing a large proportion or a measurable amount of carbon into the new concrete that's being cast. So yes, yeah, so I'll have a little session on these two uh, a little a little later on today. So why do we need to unlock the benefits of early project partnerships? We have across the world owners, or de developers or designers or or companies that want to work everywhere. Now when they work everywhere, they want to, in most state, most places have the same as they've made at home. So we are here to help. If you're engaged by one of these large uh, or international type of owners or international um, teams, we're help, here to help you support them. So when they require a certain specification or a certain performance out of a product that they're used to or that they like, or they're comfortable with because it has the right approvals for their insurance, then we can help put that together you across whatever boundaries or what, across any international borders. So help is on hand. So the main stages of project with our feasibility, concept design, outline, the detailed design. I might just watch for this one because I keep wavering about. Watch this is up. Tender and contract negotiation, tender award construction. I oh, know it's kind of hard to understand. But it's okay. Um, completion operation. There's a maintenance period or a maintenance that we can support on for existing structures, and of course demolition and rebuild with the new recover recover program that's coming together. So Seeker are there in these bits for for, for your team. So in the detailed design and the tender part, 
the tender ward, the construction part, so we have site team that can come and support the installations and make sure the systems are going in correctly. In 2017, there was a survey conducted uh, with NBS specifiers asking questions to try and understand where best we can support uh, your, your industry. And where the, where the most interest came from during uh, write or modify the specifications or where they consider or select to give, this, uh, give performance criteria is usually at the developed design stage or during the technical design stage. So we can support in those in the early, uh, as, as soon as you come across anything in your developed design, we can start to support ongoing from there, even if it's an early, early discussion about connectability and, uh, and use our history and use our experience to get past uh, some of those hurdles that we know will come in these projects. So we know that the projects are becoming more complex. We see this every day, but we have solutions to support. We have solutions to, to overcome. We know that you are like never going to have enough time, never going to have enough resources. So we will do our best to save you some time and make that process a little bit more efficient. We know that you know we don't know everything. Collectively, we have a good coverage with 27,000 of us. So you you may have also in your teams a similar knowledge gaps, so we can help you to fill those knowledge gaps in. You probably need a complete solution from A to Z or from basement to roof, so we can support, so Seeker will support with a full specification suite from ground, below ground to concrete admixtures right up to the roof and to solar finishing. If there are no standards or there's a lack of standards, then we can help to guide you to standards that might be more acceptable, maybe from another country or what we test to or what is most relevant for the type of application that you're looking at. And look, we know that often you'll need a global partner, and Seeker truly is a global company with a, with a presence in over 100 countries around the world. So we can give you the solutions from basement to roof. So this particular building here is in Zurich in Switzerland, and all these yellow spots in this uh, section through are where Seeker is, uh, has given a solution. So if you've got a project like this that you want to slice through and say, well, okay, help us to populate or propagate all these little sections that we're not quite sure on how to connect, then we can come in and we'll talk with you and we work our way through to, to provide a complete solution. This is actually a Seeker building. And inside Seeker, um, oops, inside is Seeker floor, Seeker bonding, coatings, everything is like a complete showcase. So we make it inside our own buildings as well, not just for everybody else. Going back to the survey, top 10 factors that specifiers consider when making a decision about the products that they use. A lot of it is about existing relationship, and that's what I'd really like to encourage today, that you call on us as a, as a friend and call on us as a partner at the earliest stage th uh, of your project to help make some streamlined decisions all the way through for you. Also with the manufacturer support during design and construction, the availability of the specification information. So we have currently 726 standard specifications in our online library available for you in CSI format, NBS format. Oops, is that me? <laughs> NBS format, uh, as well as we have an internal format. Or if you have your own format, say a, na uh, a, nas a national spec, we can also adapt it to suit your spec and, uh, and then make it work for you. And then when we asked, how confident are you in your knowledge and skills in selecting products and what percentage of respondents agree with the following statements? Many are very confident, but we find that a lot are quite confident. So there's a bit of room there for us to help to shift you from quite confident to very confident, so that you can say, I know now I have this experience with how to connect basement waterproofing to podium waterproofing, or podium waterproofing to facade waterproofing, and we can get some compatibilities and continuities from single source. So that sort of detailing is really available uh, for, for you to call on any time you like. And you see here, 
better communication is needed between consultants, contractors, and manufacturers to ensure effective product selection uh, processes. The waterproofing standard in, uh, in, in Britain calls that the manufacturer is part of the design team at the earliest point. Because ultimately, if you leave the waterproofing, for instance, too, too late, then it is far too late and it becomes more expensive than, than uh, and quite a headache for the owners. So the earlier we can be involved, we can talk through some of the issues that we know may come up and then work through the solutions. Okay, so the specification development. When you write specifications, which of the following processes describe how you generally do it? Who knows this one? I reuse specifications I've used for other projects. This is very common. So if it worked last time, I'm sure it'll work this time. So it's important to consider all the factors of every individual project and see how to optimize for this particular project, not the last project. Okay, so we're Technology moves on, what worked 20 years ago may still work today, but we might have a more efficient way of doing it. So the earlier we can have these discussions, you know, and, and really tailor these solutions for, for your project and your client. And look, so we know that you collect the information from manufacturers, put it together. Most practices have quite an extensive library of uh, product books, manuals. Uh, even, even from Seeker, we have a nice fat product book uh, in Malaysia here, but it takes the time to print before maybe there's some changes and it, it might be outdated by the time it hits the, hits the library. So it's important that we come and speak with you regularly to make sure that you've got the latest technology and I'll cover off a couple of those things later on today about you know just what's coming in the future and, and how we how we want to want to support it. And you see here there's a there's still a group over a third that ask manufacturers to write specifications for me. If you can get a supplier like Seeker to write the specification for you and you check it, it's saving you some time, and the client is happy and you're happy, then it's a win-win situation all round. So how strongly do you agree or disagree with the following statements? We often rush the process, there's not enough of us that know how to write specifications, and the specifications are a chore. This is quite common. So it's not, don't feel all of a sudden, oh, that's me, because it's not. It's everybody who rush specifications and sometimes don't have a chance to go right through and read all the clauses within the specification. It may look the same as last time, but maybe two or three clauses have been taken out or two or three clauses have been added in. So we need to work through those. Not enough people in our practice know how to write them. So let us help you teach. Let us help to show your your new graduates, or some that are used to working in one format, how to, how to also consider it in another format. Which of the following types of information have you or your organization included? Descriptive, proprietary information, so actually naming a, a, specify, a, a product supplier, 82% said yes. Now that may sound, uh, you know, I know that ultimately you need a performance spec. Now, if a branded product can meet that performance spec, I don't think there's a, a really strong argument to not have that, you know, to protect yourself and protect your specification and the work that you've put in, to put the brand in. Um, whether, I mean, ultimately it would be nice to have Seeker, but it's not always going to be Seeker for the performance spec. It's not an issue to put the brand in. So we have in hard copy or soft copy our product data sheets, our information, which are the primary source of the information. So if there's any change or update, it will happen on our product data sheet first. Okay, And if there's ever a conflict, the product data sheet will take precedence. So just so you're aware, if a specification comes out and the information is different to the data sheet, the data sheet will win. So we can, this is a, an example of a, a CSI branded specification, and it goes through all the spec clauses. This one on the left here. It goes through all the spec clauses inside the document, all the installation, all the things to look for, all the QA, and the method uh, statements that refers to how to do the installation. So that you're seeing the same information 
that the general contractor is seeing, the same information that the applicator or the installer is seeing, or the builder, so that there's no confusion for anybody. It's always straightforward. We read from the same book. And the second document here, which will be available from, from the Sika Malaysia team, is what we call a brief. It's at the very first meeting or the very first call, we work through the whole project and just make some notes into a formal little book, formal informal little book, so that you've got a quick reference as you carry on through the specification for that project. And it's not to lock anything in, it's just to say, look, we're here to support, we've got your back. So how about we talk early, we put some guidance in, and then this document can help to fulfill or help to inform the balance of the, of the project specification. Digital transformation, we have 2D drawings available. We'll support you on the 2D drawing for our standard, standard detailing. 3D visualizations for your client or even for the contractor or the tenderers if they want to know what it looks like. And of course, we have a library of film objects uh, that are readily available. You tell us what you need, we give you the object, you amend it as you, as you want within your model, and, uh, and we can connect those BIM objects together as well from, say, a floor BIM, a floor object to a, to a wall object to an exterior object. So they're all available to plug in to your model as you, as you start detailing up. To give you an idea on how that sort of goes on site, you start with your 2D CAD, work into 3D visualization so that we know what it should look like, and then delivery on site, Seek will make sure that it looks like the drawing. So then when it's full of concrete, we know that it's going to be as we as we agreed to install it. Sustainable, so Seek is on a very strong path for sustainability and, uh, and ESG. Uh, I didn't put much more than this in because when you go to the sustainability page on our corporate web page, there's about 80 pages uh, in all scopes. So we are really driving uh, ourselves and we're driving our customers and we're driving our suppliers. So we've got full traceability, complete life cycle assessments for the products. So you can rest assured that if you have some requirement for sustainability or some requirement for performance for your customer that we can support right through with validation from third party. What's also available, like today, but uh, you know, on a smaller scale, one on one, one on two, or, or group of 10, or indeed a lecture hall, we, ha we can give lectures on systems, the selection of those systems, the application, how to maintain. You know, it's all good and well giving you the car, but you need to know how to look after it. Also repairs, how do we repair some of these systems? What hygiene standards you might, might, might need or what uh, technical standards you might need for an you know, for a electrostatic dissipating floor, for instance, and how do those technical standards apply to your project? So like I said, it's not just me. We have all the team here, 334, I believe, in Sika Malaysia. And then we also have a small team in each country. Some countries have bigger teams, but some countries uh, come from Sika New Zealand, where we had 100 people across the whole country, including the warehouse and the production staff. So we were in a very large team. Uh, but we have 18. We have presence in 18 countries in Asia Pacific. So if you're working outside of bounds of Malaysia or you're look, working on a project in another country, we can support your design here based on what's available there. So it saves you having to look and, and, and try and find out what's available locally. Talk to us, we can put team in touch with team and we can make that connection so that we can save you some time and make the project more successful at the end. Give you an idea on the coverage for global key owners and global support team. It's headed up by a, a guy called Jeremy who sits in Switzerland. Then we have got a team in a guy in US, in Spain, UK, Italy, um, France, and uh, and there's me down here in, in Asia Pacific uh, with my colleague Charles, who's also based in Singapore, and then we also have Latin America and the UAE. So as your owners or your clients and customers come to you from other parts of the world and they have an experience in another part of the world, 
reach out. We can tap into these guys to find out how, how best to support your client. So we will look after the owner and the investor at the, at the, with the team that I just showed you. And then in the regions like myself, we'll hopefully encourage more engagement with specifiers, key specifiers like yourself. And then we'll work with the local team in each country to support delivery on site with the contractors and as well as making sure that we get everything signed off. It does overall make uh, a commercial benefit to your client. You know, with, a, with a single source supplier and a large supplier in, in the industry, you know that we can deliver it. We've got very strong local presence and as we've all seen in the last, certainly in the last year and a half, the supply chain is being pressured everywhere. So you need a strong financial partner, you need a strong partner that's got good operations to make sure that what you specify can be delivered when it needs to be delivered for your client. You know, Nobody likes the EOT at the back end of the project. Nobody likes to submit those claims for an extension of time. Okay, so that's that's the specification side and what we really want to, to let you know is how to, you know, we're willing and open and ready to engage at any stage of your pro process. And just to give you an overview of maybe some of the things that you didn't know we could help you with. So our business is based around eight different segments or what we call a target market, from concrete right through to ceiling and bonding, flooring, building finishing, and, uh, and there's also a target market called industry. So this is all the OEMs, car builders like Tesla, um, guys that make wind turbines, we help to glue them together, bus makers, tram makers, train makers, all of those sorts of things are in the industry side. The other seven target markets are construction. So concrete, we work with 3D mix guys who help them give the high performance concrete where needed. We also provide, uh, which is not really relevant today, but just out of interest, we, we help with cement manufacturers to make their processes more efficient, to give them a much finer cement and a much better quality product and save them some money. So that's part of our business, which you don't see. On the waterproofing side, main applications that we have, flexible membranes, so sheet membranes, plus weldable connection details for water bars or water stops, injectable water bars, injectable membranes, liquid applied water bars, uh, injections for ground injection to stabilize before your tunnel goes through or before your building gets built. And then on the roofing side, at the top of the building, we have options for exposed, mechanically fixed or adhered. Uh, gravel ballasted roofs are quite common and green roofs are becoming more and more common, as well as the solar roof. So with the solar roof, big issue is we need the solar panels to stay without being blown off. How do we mechanically hold them down without drilling a hole in the roof? So the systems we have include a mount that sits on top and is part of the membrane system. So you don't actually have to penetrate to put your solar panels on top. And this will become more and more as solar panels get cheaper and the output gets better. It's cities will start to push every building to be wanting some, some solar on the top to start capturing that free energy source. On the flooring side we have production and warehouse facilities, back of house, baggage handling for airports, you know, walkways, uh, carriageways. We have clean, what we call clean room floors. So if you need a specific type of floor that has got low VOC and has been tested for total of particulate emissions over the life of its, of its uh, use, then we can give you the external certifications from the Fraunhofer to, to, support, uh, to support the systems going into those type of applications. Car parks. Uh, floors and commercial, residential or public areas, resilient, seamless two to four mil uh, flooring systems that give you a nice, comfortable walk as well as noise dampening between floors and footfall. When we join like materials or dislike materials, we need to have something in between that doesn't damage one or break both. So we have flexible bonding systems as well as you know, you might have uh, something that needs to be rigid bonded. So 
depending on the substrate and depending on what that composite material is or what that material is will help us to help you to select the right product. If you have a really hard connection sealant but a really soft substrate, it's going to be the substrate that gives up and you end up with some damage to your structure. So always we want the sealant to be like a fuse because it's easier to replace than the component of your building. Uh, so wood floor, we can bond wood floors to stop the, the interstory inter noise. And then all of your finishing sealants, so your silicons at the kitchens, your silicons for around bathroom areas, tiled areas. So myself, I look after the refurbishment business in Asia Pacific as well. And this is all a, what the second half of it was, second session today will be about so just an insight into the concrete protection. Um, we also bond bridges together, elevated, elevated railways, increased capacity of buildings. So if you have an old building that you'd like to change the use, and now you need it to be stronger, but you haven't got room to put more, more structure in, we can help with the systems to increase what you already have. On the building finishing side, renders uh, for exterior, interior, and, and tile systems. So all of these things are available to you in specification format or brochure format or a talk to your, your client to help uh, to help get the message across that, that if we start connecting at the right places then we can reduce the, the risk for you as a specifier and reduce the risk for the client and reduce the risk across all parts of your project. So just an interesting point on, on the last, it's industry is not uh, like I said, it's not in the construction part of our business, but over 50% of all cars have a, have a secret product somewhere in them. So when you see your windscreen has been broken and they have to clear the sealant out, it's usually going to be a secret sealant. So we're hidden away everywhere. We just don't, you just don't always see us. So we want, we would like to be a one-stop shop to offer our help, offer our ideas, Know, collaborate with you as, as often and as early or as, uh, as, 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 as you can to hopefully deliver uh, your project to full fruition and successfully uh, so that we can move on to the next one and allow you to carry on being creative. So how are we going to do that with partnerships? We want to build some trust. We have a global footprint. We're reliable. We are across lots and lots of different applications. So if you come across one you've never heard of, or something that somebody asked for, something that you've never heard of, give us a call. We probably have someone who's an expert in it. Full solutions, single source supply, uh, and we can work to optimize. You know, when we have a holistic view, we can really start to optimize for, for the out best outcomes for the project. And then, of course, we learn. We learn every day where our whole team is learning still, and whatever we learn, we want to impart to, to you as well. So that's the first session, uh, really about partnerships and how we can help, how we can connect with, with you and your teams. Uh, you know, obviously obligation free, but really to, to draw on that experience that we have over the last 110 years with such an enormous team. Um, have we got any questions? Anything there that you didn't know or didn't see? Haven't seen before? No? Okay. Feel free to throw the questions out any time. So that was the 15 minutes plus, I think, a, a section of the, the next 60 minutes. Testing or so I think first and foremost let's give a round of applause to our guest today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt. If anybody would like to, uh, honestly, there's there's no really no reason to be shy. I'm sure some of you have questions. I have questions as well, but of course we would like to open it up to the audience. So if you do have anything right now, just raise your hand, and we'll come and pass you the mic. So uh, can we have the um, okay? Here you are. 
know there's a, a slide which is hydrophobic impregnation. Yes. Um, does it mean that uh, you impregnate the concrete which is impervious? Or was it uh, a layer of application on top of resistive concrete? Can you elaborate a bit more? Sure. I'll, I'll cover this off in the, in the, in the next session, but I, I can address that right now as well. Yes, yeah, so hydrophobic impregnation, as we all know, concrete is, is still porous by nature, but it's quite porous on a, on a very minute or micro scale. So by applying a hydrophobic impregnation, it works its way through and starts to you know, fill up those voids so that water can't get in because it's such a large molecule. It allows vapor out, which is a smaller molecule, but it won't allow water in. So that, if you stop the water getting into your concrete structure, then you also stop it bringing uh, aggressive contaminants and to start uh, breaking down the concrete or attacking or reinforcing. Or maybe for a dam for construction? No, for any, any concrete at all. So if, if you like, for instance, this sort of thing, if this was external and you like the look of it, then you could apply a hydrophobic impregnation to the surface, you don't really see it, but when the water comes, it can't penetrate into the concrete. And so, what that does is it extends the life. The hydrophobic impregnation system that risks when the concrete has got a crack lines or um, structure movement. Yeah. Will it will the hydrophobic um, impregnation be compromised? If that's that's the case. To a certain extent, to a certain extent, but because of the surface tension it creates. Uh, once the crack opens up to a certain width, then you're stuck with a crack, and then you need to deal with the crack. But the hydrophobic will also, if you apply it to a cracked surface, because it penetrates, will penetrate and give you that same surface tension inside the crack, so you have less water that actually gets in, so it does reduce it. But a cracked structure, if it's a structural issue, should be dealt with uh, from a structural point of view. If it's an aesthetic thing, then you would you know, make the make the best call about what you how to deal with it, and and then apply the hydrophobic afterwards. Um, you say that uh, hydrophobic impregnation um, will be easy off. Say, for instance, uh, surface application like uh, either or kind of space, or choose one or the other. What what usually um, informs that decision is the budget. So ultimately, if you if you think we you want concrete is fantastic in compression. Steel is is there to give us the ductility for the, for our uh, element. If we have something going in, we can consider the concrete as a protective coating. So 30, 40 mm protective coating for the steel. Now, if we want to extend the life of that 40 mm coating, we can put something on the outside of that. Hydrophobic provides an extension for the concrete itself, and the coating provides an extension for uh, the hydrophobic and the concrete, so you can start, you know, doubling down on the protection. It just depends where the budget runs out. Often, an asset owner will start with the hydrophobic and put the coating part back, say to five, ten years, when they can, write, you know, when it's part of a, an ongoing maintenance. Double protection. Correct. So the coating repels because it's per, uh, impervious and the hydrophobic repels in case there are any misses or holidays or any holes that turn up afterwards, you have the secondary backup. Kind of an admixture. No surface applied. No, what I meant was the, the hydrophobic impregnation. Is it admixture to the concrete? Sur surface applied. So surface we applied. could apply it to this concrete now. Uh, so, so I was thinking the same thing. I was wondering what hydrophobic impregnation was. So it should not be. Hydrophobic impregnation it should be hydrophobic application, isn't it? Oh, I have no idea, man. You need to ask us. <laughs> so, <laughs> an application. Terminology, isn't it? <laughs> so, an application uh, in, in our minds or how we perceive it would be like a coating that we can physically see. So, an impregnation works its way in and it's no, no longer really visible and, and it impregnates the concrete anywhere from 2 to 10 millimeters, depending on which uh, level of product you, you apply. And at 10 millimeters, you go, even 2 millimeters, you're going to extend the life of that structure because the moisture can't get, or the water can't get in. And so the water can't start breaking down the concrete and it can't break down the reinforcement. But it, you don't really see it. If you want to paint or put in a protective coating in later on, then you also add the life of the protective coating to the life of the hydrophobic, to the life of the cover of the concrete. So it's still an application, 
but it's a, in, because it goes into the concrete, it, it's an impregnation. So great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like the name of a grunge band, doesn't it? A hydrophobic impregnation. <laughs> Indeed. Something from Seattle in the early 90s. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's cool. I mean, I've not heard that term before myself, so I really did want to ask that question myself. So I'm, he, he beat me to it, which is fine. So can we have the next question from the audience, please? Okay, we've got the gentleman in orange at the side. Uh, please introduce yourself, sir. Hello. Uh, Morning. Uh, architect Bernard Lau here. Uh, I've used uh, quite extensive the sauna field PVC membrane on concrete roof, black roof with a very low gradient. The material, the material, the material perform well. The drawback is the surface protective screen that we have to put on top. That maybe within the first year, they they are in place. Second year, you will notice the surface of the protective screen showing stress, crack, but down there, the PVC sauna field is okay, it's intact. So it becomes another decision now, what do you do with something that you specify uh, and seen it? It has not leaked into the building yet, but the owner is coming after you. Hey, this is very ugly and pieces are spoiling, you know. So it's something that I yet to I want to ask. In lieu of the cement screen to protect the PVC, can there be another material on top of that rather than this cement product? Short, the short answer is yes. Uh, so the, the primary function of the sarnafil is to keep the water out. If you don't have a lot of traffic over it, then you need something to protect mm. from that traffic. Mm. So you, if it's a, a, a walkway for um, for services, then there's a walkway pad that can, you can weld on top, which means, again, no holes. And the reason the screed is probably breaking down is it's probably unreinforced. Uh, so usually you can go to a maximum I think three inches or, or six, 68 millimeters or something like that, unreinforced. Then you're basically putting a structural slab any thicker than that. They will undoubtedly crack uh, when they have traffic without un, without reinforcement. Uh, and a screed is unfortunately often seen as a cheap protection layer. So each time you cheapen it down and you take some of the performance out of that screed, the life also goes. So it starts to break down a lot quicker, it cracks up a lot quicker, and when it starts to break down, it accelerates and it's, and it's breaking down. So the options, once it's broken down, are take it off or put something over the top of it that's not going to, that's not going to make it worse. Ultimately, the, the primary thing that you don't want to happen is that you have sharp chunks working, working under load on top of the membrane and damaging the membrane. But it could be, you know, for the, for the, for the future, there might be other options. You might want to put a you know, an insulation board on top, and then and then a walkway on top of that, or a floating deck can also be an option, where, where you put a little mounting pad and a and, and a floating deck, or just maybe increase the screed performance a little. Say, look, we don't just want some sand cement mixed on site. We actually want a proprietary material that we know the performance of. And we lay it to a set standard, and we cure it properly so that we know that we can extend the performance of that screen. But hopefully, we don't. Hopefully, it doesn't break down to the point that it starts to damage the roof. Um, if you go to inject or crack repair with epoxy, then you also have the issue of the resin getting through. Uh, and if the resin goes through, it will bind up, the, bind up the screen, but it may also uh, be quite sharp onto the onto the membrane. Answer mostly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have the next question? If anybody else wants to ask something. I 
guess the questions are going to come in later mm. after breakfast. Uh, if it was karaoke, it would be crazy here. Everyone would be wanting the microphone. <laughs> it happens here occasionally. Nice. You all agree, right? I mean, we do have karaoke sessions here occasionally. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's yeah. always the same. Uh, don't give it to me, and then when you get it, I'll uh, give it back. Okay. Well, I'm just curious, though, some of the um, projects that you have in the country, what are the challenges you face when some of the products that you apply here, right? What are the challenges you face in implying some of those products over here? I mean, what problems do you face? Like, for instance, you know, obviously, in being a tropical country, uh, if you build something, let's say, within the city, the urban context, and you build something, let's say, by the, closer by the sea, right? What are the challenges that you face, and, and what's the most interesting challenge that you've gotten so far uh, working in this part of the world? A lot, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm being straight up here, a lot comes down to the budget, mm -hmm. uh, and the performance criteria versus the budget is always going to be a, a, tough, a tough ask. Um, any, anything near the sea should be protected because of that zone. Uh, and you should not really, if you can avoid compromising, try not to compromise on the structure and the, and the performance products when you're in those zones. Equally in the city, you have, uh, you know, we have a lot of um, CO2, so you have a lot of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide attack to your concrete structures. So don't be, don't be scared to put in some, uh, some measures as part of your specifications. Say, look, we like either a uh, higher performance concrete or some sort of coating to, to extend the life. Remember our concrete works and it's a great product, but it can also be deteriorated without maintenance or without the right protections in, in place as well. So the challenges we have are number one budget, no matter where you are, it's always a Fair point. challenge. Um, and then understanding the zone. You know, understanding that if we're working in this particular zone, we need a suite of performance for that zone, and it's not necessarily going to be the same as in the city, say a, a structure by a, a river or an estuary versus right on the coast. Uh, so there might be a roof system or, or a green roof system that works in a city, but it may not work as well. Uh, for instance, like a metal metal profile roof may not work in a, in a, in a seaside resort as well as it does in the city. Right. You know, one of the interesting things I think you mentioned is that you guys would like to initiate partnerships as early as possible, correct? But I think most of us would like to know what specific point are you looking at? Like, for instance, let's say someone comes up to an architect and says, Mr. Architect, I have a four-story shop lot for you to do. So at one point, should the architect actually say, okay, let's get in touch with Sika and let's see how best we can execute whatever the project might be? I think, as, you know, as soon as you secure the agreement, uh, there's no problem with Sika signing an NDA. Uh, to protect your, um, you know, your IP as well as protecting the client from 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 uh, the marketplace. So Seek is happy to sign NDAs for projects. You may find that, uh, which is quite often the case when we talk to owners and the designers at the same time, the owner will have a certain concept or picture of what they believe they're going to get, but they don't have a concept or a picture of that their budget is not going to achieve that. Uh, so we got asked the question yesterday from an engineer, oh, what's the best way to waterproof a basement or, you know, the cheapest way? And I said, well, the cheapest way is not to do anything and let the water run. But you have to ask the client if they're happy with that. So if the client says, I want super dry subterranean area, then we can talk, we don't mind being even engaged with those, at those conversations. And we can say, well, look, here's a photo of a super dry archive situation full membrane system with a full water stop, high density waterproof concrete, no moisture. But here's the realistic cost implications of that, uh, that level. Would you be acceptable to a little bit of moisture, say, damp patches? Or would you be okay even with a little bit of water flow? Show them some pictures and videos and say, here's the range of what you're asking us to do. You choose. You're the client, you choose. Don't ask for that one, but want to pay the budget for this one. So that we, we can be a, er, as early as that, you know, just to show you our experience. And uh, sometimes the client will say, okay, we don't need the archive after all. We're just going to put some, you know, it's just going to be client parking during the day or something like that. So we can actually go to grade three you know, and downgrade it. So now you know 
it's narrowed down the target a lot more for you based on our experience and then we can work accordingly on systems that will achieve a grade three as opposed to a grade one so the earlier anywhere you're comfortable to have us sit around the table we're happy to come and sit around the table thank you well you know despite our best efforts there are always going to be issues at site you know no matter what you do yes. there's always going to be some issue that suddenly pops out of completely out of nowhere so assuming for instance if you're taking the example of the waterproofing of a basement and you did everything you're supposed to do regulations all of that but there's still somewhere along the line something happens so how do you fix that problem as you go along do you like conduct investigations and then you propose solutions or how does it work you're right there's always there are always hiccups or little speed humps along the way for for projects and it could could be as simple as a, a misunderstanding or a, a mistiming often these things are a mistiming where the schedule is intended to be here but it doesn't quite line up with the contractor or the installer at that particular moment so they get pushed a little bit further back now yeah. without a proper record of that process it's quite difficult to understand what what goes on right we'll come to site anytime you ask us to uh -huh. have, a, have a look and and work our way through it's very rare that you'll find uh, especially for waterproofing like you say that a sheet membrane will leak sheet membranes very very rarely leak the joins where they're being connected yes. might leak or a damage might leak but the membrane itself as far as the product goes you know doesn't leak right so it's really about understanding the right installation and highlighting where the issues could be before they turn up and then when they do turn up we come collaboratively without finger pointing and we look at what's happened and then we part chart a path to rectify you know and that's I think that's the, the that's generally how seeker would handle that situation say well look we have systems to, to rectify it how about we support you to in implement those systems to rectify um, you know and and make it beneficial for all parties as opposed to finger pointing it's the applicator it's the general contractor it's the product it's the, the detailing mm -hmm. so we all work together to try and to, to work on the best outcome charting forward and most importantly learn that for the next one we don't run into the same issue uh, uh, again or to the same extent anyway thank you so much and we have questions from the audience as well I'm sure some of you have questions don't worry we won't bite you just raise your hand we'll come and pass you the mic Jesse, at the back. okay well actually I was just gonna ask you um, since I actually have a lot of questions as well um, these past two years have been very difficult for a lot of people and I can imagine Sika as well especially when you spoke about the supply chain issue so for instance projects you know that you needed to get things done quickly how did you actually solve some of those issues I mean what were the steps you took and what were the strategies you employed to ensure that construction was as interrupted as minimally as possible so Sika like everybody in each country had had to follow the rules of that uh, prevail, you know prevailing government so if the project was closed down and production was closed down then we we had to follow the same rules what did happen was when things opened up again uh, some of the projects had a delay or some of the projects were cancelled so the, the supply chain issues didn't really hit initially because we, we still had product on the water that was arriving in most countries and those that stock holding allowed us to supply and support those projects that kicked off early the actual lag was was a little bit later mm -hmm. so probably six to nine months later the lag when when shipping channels really started to get blocked up to overcome those we have to just be uh, cognizant of of our, our customers position you know they've made a commitment to their customer to, to deliver as have we so if there were increases in cost we we as much as we could uh, took those on board to maintain the supply uh, it was very clear that supply was number one and price was second so the cost had to be pushed down a little to make sure that we got supply if you made cost the primary concern then you might not get supply and then you can't do anything with no supply so each country handled it a little differently those that had local manufacturing 
obviously a lot better off. But the supply chain didn't just hit us as a, it also hit the raw materials. So the raw material suppliers also had a lag that, that started to affect. Um, I mean, the craziest one is because people weren't driving their cars around the world, people weren't buying new cars. So the guys that were making fuel and making all the componentry turned off the refinery. So everybody that buys that buy products or down, downstream products from the refineries had no product. They had no raw materials. So it really started to impact, uh, like you see with uh, the, the chips, Seeker is similar. We, buy, we have downstream refinery raw materials. So we had to deal with making sure we could source and have a stronger option uh, as it was being managed. So mm. each, each raw material supplier actually managed lots of force majeures around the world. Uh, locally, lots of force majeures for, for suppliers as well. So those had to be managed quite intricately, quite difficultly. Um, but it was a tough, it, and it still is, you know, there's still still tough times to come as far as supply chains are con uh, concerned. I understand. Force majeure, that is a difficult situation. Something unexpected, like a black swan event. And we have um, another question from the audience. It's a very shy group today. Everyone's already in the Medeka mood, I guess, want to celebrate next week already. Holiday and all that. Independence is at the end of the month. Okay. So I think everyone's already in the Medeka mood. Uh, was there uh, someone from the audience who wanted to... Are there the same gentleman in orange? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, well, we're probably going to go for breakfast soon, uh, for a break soon, and then we'll get the second session shortly. Okay. okay. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, back to this uh, crack roof uh, and drainage. Uh, sometimes it's also there are two components. We work, having decided, like when we did, we chose Sika Sana Field. With the protective script over most of the gutter, about 3.5 meter continuous run gutter. Very long, many buildings, all connected. We then had a problem too many downpipes to drain from the gutter. So, at the point of designing, putting in all the downpipes, 100 diameter to 150. We were looking at 200 over downpipes. And this is a shopping center. <laughs> anyway, it's up in the mountain, Genting, Genting, on top of a car park. So someone brought me to talk to uh, this Australian company, Typhonic. They have a very good system. So we married the drain with the Sika thing. And we only use 20, 300 diameter downpipe to drain the entire roof all the way down to the road level. So from 200 over downpipes to 20. So sometimes we have to break away from the conventional drainage where you still feel there's too many of these breaking your facade, interfering with so many uh, MAE systems trying to locate a discharge point. And this group came in and we only had to put those 300 diameter in the staircase. They are not seen. 20 of them and drain the whole shopping. So it's about, I think, four years or five years now, gone back. No complaint of any leak in that area. And that area I do experience pretty high uh, intense rainfall for short period every day <laughs> because it's up in the mountain. So this is something that I just want other architects to to be not constrained by uh, roof is only this, but the idea is take the water away from the roof as fast and you solve your problem. The secret is that. Yeah, yeah right. The longer we can leave water there, the more time it has to think about getting in. And uh, <laughs> that applies to the roof, applies to facade, applies to below grade as well. 
sooner we can drain a cavity below grade, the better. Because otherwise the water will just find a way in. Yeah, There's plenty of time to think about it. Water thank thank you for that. Uh, Siphonic uh, are good hydraulic engineers. Um, and, you know, they're not the only hydraulic engineer, but they do have some good options and good solutions based yeah. on the volume and the period of, of, of time, as well as the fall, uh, fall that you have to your, your outlets. And they're, they're quite good at mapping, mapping exactly what you need to, to and, and then building in some buffers for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Every question has, every, did someone start clapping? Is it? You can if you want to. So <laughs> can we give a round of applause to the gentleman in the audience as well? Yeah, thank you. Don't be shy. There is no restriction on clapping, ladies and gentlemen. You can clap as much as you like, as often as you like, as loudly as you like, OK? No, speaking of, oh, thank you so much, man. <laughs> Finally, a lot of enthusiasm. Huh? Uh, because Madeka is at the end of the month, so I guess we're all getting ready to celebrate our Independence Day, especially with that new uh, Madeka Day logo. Uh, actually, I'm thinking um, roofs, right? We've done this for a long time, and all that. Are green roofs becoming more and more popular throughout the, throughout the years? I mean, have you seen more and more applications where green roofs are being incorporated into buildings, and therefore, you know, there's a different set of requirements where Sika is concerned? Yes. Yeah. So the green roofs, not not. Not just look nice; they also provide an additional, uh, especially when you have these these down downfalls of large volumes of water. You know, there's there are retention device uh, to slow the speed. So, you know, for your instance, where you had 200 outlets, maybe a green roof could have been an option if the structure was there as well, because that will retain and dissipate the energy from that water. You know, 80, 90 percent of the water, depending on the design of the green roof and what you put on it. But they're they're becoming more and more apparent um, ac across uh, across the globe, and they also help to reduce this heat island effect that we end up with in cities. Um, and they're just nicer, especially if it's going to be a shared space with with people. You know, green roof is really nice to look at, and it's quite nice to look at from a neighbouring building as well. Um, the the issues with um, selecting green roof is, is not so much about. Uh, Systems that seek a supply, it's about choosing the right build up and mm. choosing the right plants. So sometimes you can put the plants up there and they just don't last because they're not designed for that environment or they're not used to being put into that environment. They look very nice for about six months, but then you know, so it's really important that you have somebody that designs the green roof that knows how to look after the, the media, knows how to look after the plants that they're going to put in, and uh, and that. Same information is related to the building owner or the building management, so that it doesn't die off. Do yes. you see a proliferation of green roofs in this part of the world as well? Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Southeast Asia in general. Yeah? Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it, but there's also that trade-off with solar roof. You know, where uh, we put a green roof, or do we put a solar roof, right. or we do a combination? I and see. if they do a combination, you know, where's the budget going to come from? Mm -hmm. You know, your payback for solar may be. 15, 18, 20 years before you get paid back for the solar. So it depends on how long the owner wants to own that building for and, and what their intended outcomes are. Um, and, and the budget is, is, a, is always a restraint with green roof as well. Okay. Because you need to allow for a much stronger roof structure than a lightweight traditional roof structure. Mm -hmm. Yes, the weight is always an issue, isn't it? Especially because you mentioned dissipating the energy. Uh, where green roofs are concerned. And uh, I'm not really sure what you meant by that. How do you dissipate an energy uh, burst of sorts uh, when, a roof, uh, when a green roof is involved? So if you've ever, I mean, for, for this gentleman's roof, if you've ever stood, ba stood by a downpipe in a, down, in a heavy, heavy rain event and you can hear the water gushing. Right. And, and it's really rushing. So when it hits a green roof, it takes that energy out. And because it's filtering the water, it actually only comes, no matter how fast the rain is going, it generally right. takes, the water generally comes out still at the same speed. It's actual so physical energy then. Physical energy. Discipline. Okay. Yes. The ferocity of the rain. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Can we have uh, another question from the uh, audience? Would anybody like to ask anything? I do apologize. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to speak with a mask on. So I may have um, sound muffled every once in a while. I'm standing over here, isolated. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting used to it, I guess. So can we have another question from the audience? Does anybody else like to ask? I think that lady in black. 
Can we have a, a mic pass to the lady in black over here? Uh, right in the middle of the hall. Please do introduce yourself. And uh, of course, we are eager to hear your question. Uh, hi, I'm Rowan. Uh, before this, you mentioned that uh, Sika is moving to its more eco friendly, uh, uh, a more eco friendly company. So, may I know what are the steps you do take apart from production, uh, uh, especially through the supply chain and the delivery of, of the product? I can, give, I can give you a bit of an overview. Uh, but the it's detail is question, very, very yeah. detailed. Uh, so we, we, we have what we call a uh, supplier audit. So each of those, so where we buy raw materials from, we need to understand what their, what their, um, what their sustainability path is as well. And then they get um, rated. So all our suppliers get rated. And those actually add on to ours, including the transport from that supplier to us, our production, our water, redu water reduction, our waste reduction, um, at the moment, we've got a real push to reincorporate our waste or our uh, byproducts back into the, our products so that we're not discharging waste. And then we have to add on the production costs, human human costs, time costs, um, material costs, and, and transport to our customer. So if we're transporting directly to a site, it's quite different to transporting to, a say, a, a store because then you get to transport there plus storage plus transport to site. So that needs to be measured separately and rated separately. And then once it's once we have those, we also we also have to consider the use of the product and who's using the product. So for instance, a simple thing like a dust free cementitious product is a nicer environment for the user. So when you're mixing the product it doesn't give up a lot of dust. So that's being implemented across the range of grouts and mortars for, for our for our customers. So that also gets measured. Then the installation, the product, we're really pushing to have products that are easier to use, more ergonomically uh, comfortable for the user to install, and then long-term the life cycle assessment, including the recycle options, and including, you know, in 25 years, what happens to that product? Does it just go to landfill, or does it, can it come back, and can we reuse it? So all of those are in the pathway. Um, and on the other side, we know that because all our large multinational contractors are also being measured with their uh, ESG contributions, that we need to be understanding what they are being measured on. Because as much as we measure everybody in the path before us, they measure everybody in the path before them, which, which includes us. So on, on the... The primary function to be more sustainable, it, it, we are on the right path, and and you know other other suppliers will be as well. The the I guess the difference is when you have scale, uh, you can move a little bit faster, you know. And when you when you when you have when you can engage a complete team to start working on it versus, uh, you know, maybe not quite the same size company might not be able to do it as quickly. Um, so once we once we provide those to those customers, then they will also get rated. So our customers get rated. So we need to understand what they are looking for. So ultimately, there's a drive to be sustainable, but also if we can encourage our customers to have a much better uh, footprint, then we, you know, long-term business-wise, should get more retention and more selection because we can contribute to their performance uh, as opposed to if, if you're not considering it long term then maybe you may not be considered as a supplier long term so that's kind of the pathway it makes the most sense for sustainability but it also makes business sense and we know that with um you know with with carbon trading and in the recent uh, you know offsets where do they turn up and once they start getting those in place in government uh, and and in countries and being able to trade between governments then that's when you'll see the the the, the the rest of the industry will start to change because it will start to be mandated and it will become even more um, attractive business-wise. Thank you. Welcome. Hope that was en enough. But Thank by all means, if you go to our homepage, there's uh, a drop-down tab and there's all the information plus the validations uh, and all the certifications. Um, we're not allowed to publish anything that, that cannot be validated. So.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, just before we go for our tea break, let's just get one last quick question and uh, we will adjourn uh, to have our breakfast for the morning. So can we have just one last question before we break for tea? Do you want to ask him a personal question? So I suppose it's fine. Ah, yes, can we have that uh, lady, please? Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Alia. You spoke about um, Sika has this structural strengthening system. So without, um, for, for current buildings, yeah? So without changing its current structural system. Um, just wondering, do you have warranty for that? And do you have any projects in Malaysia that you've done so? So, so the first question on uh, warranty, yes. Uh, all Seeker products uh, come with a performance warranty. Um, how many years? I mean, so it will depend. It's, it's yeah, it will depend on the situation, but yeah. usually, usually they will come with the the manufacturer's warranty, um, and sometimes that's guided by the requirements of of the local um, governance. So it might be this is the minimum that you're allowed to offer in Malaysia, or this is what you must offer in Indonesia. So it depends on on where the product is still the same. Just depends on 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 the regulations by country. So yes, warranty is available for that. Um, the second question, as far as projects here, and and how do we de was it how how we design them, or what projects we have in Asia? Yeah, what is maybe in Malaysia? So I, I don't have like because it's 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 structure, so it's mm -hmm. you know like the safety wise and all. So that's what I'm quite concerned about. Yep. So we do have a um. A project reference library for, for, for the well we have one globally but it comes down to region and by country and Malaysia has quite a long history in structural strengthening okay. um, I don't know the projects off the top of my my head uh, here but we, we, we have a list um, and we also have some free design software so if you're working with an engineer or you are, are an engineer you can download the software for free and the software allow you to design the strengthening scheme according to the code that you choose. If you have a local code, it may not be in the software, but we can apply to have that added to the software. At the moment, it's ACI for American Concrete Industry uh, Institute and uh, EN standards. Uh, and I think we're just going through a Spanish and Japanese at the moment. And it depends because not a lot of countries actually have uh, structural strengthening code. So that's why a lot comes from America um, and the ACI standard. It's usually based around concrete code, so the concrete structure code. Um, so that software is free, and it will only allow the potential, the possibility to give an output that is compliant, so it makes it safer for the, for the user. It won't allow you to spec over specify or under specify to meet to meet the output based on the inputs. Uh, and then, if you need fire protection for that structural strengthening, what we normally say is save the money, because in the event of a fire, you just want people out, and unless you put, unless you can retain the heat at the sea, at the structural strengthening, like the carbon fiber that's out on the on the table, below a certain threshold, uh, the the resin will soften, and then it's no longer performing its function. So you can either spend and completely insulate it, which you may have to do for the for a long escape route to get people out. But it, it's discounted straight away in in the event of fire anyway. So the so you can't uh, you by stand by the standards you're not allowed to include the strengthened member as part of your f fire performance. If you strengthen uh, and and it trades off because your member has already got some safety factors built in when designed for fire. So in the event of fire, the safety factors automatically kick in. So it actually. It doesn't automatically get stronger, but it's it's already designed to be stronger in the fire. Does that answer the question? Yeah. I see. Um, if you if you are really quite interested in, in the list or, or having a look, there are some uh, some of our team here who would be able to send that list through to you pretty quickly, or actually take you and show you some uh, some projects. That, that it's not always visible, even though it looks quite nice. I think yeah. it looks quite nice. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for the question. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause for our guest, Mr. Ruben Rees. Thanks for the questions. And of course, for the members of the audience, thank you so much, Asu. Now, we will stop here for a tea break. Now, to comply with the COVID-19 safety measures, the refreshments will be served in two different places. 
You have to go and find those places, but it's somewhere in the building. Lah. Kidding, kidding. It's on level one, which is, of course, downstairs, and, of course, at the rooftop at level eight. Refreshments are going to be served in both places, so by all means, please have, uh, have a good break. Now, the session will resume back at 11 a.m., and at 11 a.m., we are going to have the second session for this morning, entitled Concrete Structures Age 2, What Can You Do to Keep Them Healthy and Fit for Purpose? Also, by Mr. Ruben Reeves. So, of course, we will be happy to see you again in about half an hour from now. Thank you so much. Have a good break, and see you shortly. Everyone, ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. My water bottle over here. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for this morning, and thank you for the questions and the, and the good discussion. Um, I enjoyed the lunch. Thanks for the, for the food. It was really delicious. Um, so this session is going to touch on a little bit we talked about before with the hydrophobics, uh, and it's really to say, you know, we, we can't just build concrete structures and leave them as they are and think they're going to be perfect. It's a, it's a fantastic medium and obviously the most used building material in the world, but it also needs some care and, and some protection, which we can build in from the start, uh, and then we have some systems for long-term uh, rehabilitation as well. So here are the two uh, systems that we were talking about, uh, one of them earlier, the impregnates. So there's two main types of coatings that we use for concrete protection. There's a barrier coating, types like uh, epoxy coatings or polyurethane coatings or acrylic coatings or polyurea type. Depending on the technology will we'll, we'll help to define what profile of product that you need, so depending on which situation. Now with a barrier coating, as you can see at the top, it gives you a complete seal. So it stops things from getting in. So that's, that's a, a clear difference between a barrier coating and an impregnate. But it sits on the surface. So a barrier coating sits on the surface, and whatever technology you choose, depending on your environment, will help to extend the life of your concrete uh, element or your concrete structure. The second type that we were talking about earlier is the hydrophobic impregnation or the impregnates. And they are a different type of penetrating molecule, a, a silane or a siloxane type based uh, technology, based chemical, that sets up a little micro surface uh, repeller. And we also have migrating, what we call migrating corrosion inhibitors to protect our reinforcement. And then we have sodium silicates. So it depends on your concrete, and it depends what you want to protect against. So the difference is quite clear. The barrier coating is solid and doesn't allow, doesn't allow uh, anything to get in. But equally, it doesn't allow anything to get out. So if you have moisture inside your concrete that wants to get out, this is where you end up with bubbles. So you may have seen on some buildings where they're coated and you have big blisters. It's not a failure of the coating. It's a failure of the, it's, it's just a part of the, the natural process of the water escaping from the concrete. And that pressure is enough to, to, even, um, to even overcome the bond of epoxy to concrete. Okay, so we end up with osmotic blistering. So we can't stop that process happening without addressing it to, be, to begin with. On the other hand, with the impregnates, it doesn't allow a water molecule in, and a water molecule will usually, if it penetrates in, it will carry with it some, I don't know, some chlorides, or it could carry sulfates, or could carry other dissolved, um, aggressive inside solution. So if we can keep that solution out in the first place, then there's less that we less damage it can do on the inside. The other benefit is that you still have a breathable surface. So as the concrete dries out, that vapor comes out of the concrete quite easily, even though it won't let any more in. The drier the environment inside, or the lower the humidity inside your concrete, the less damaging it is to your reinforcement. So for reinforcement to start degrading or, or corroding, you need to have basically three things. You need oxygen, which you'll, you'll get 
uh, in concrete anyway. You need to have moisture, and then you need to have something else that's making it corrode. So for those three things, if you put a barrier coating, then you exclude the moisture. So you can exclude the moisture, and you can also, in certain circumstances, exclude the oxygen, so you won't get corrosion on the steel. It is a good option for protecting the reinforcement. And you might have seen this sort of effect at a pier or a jetty at the sea, where below the water level, all the concrete is still in good condition and there's no spalling, no expanding steel breaking the concrete off. But above the concrete, uh, water level, all the concrete is falling off and you see rusty bars. That's because there's no oxygen below the water. So the, it, it effect is pr pr uh, protected because it's below the water. It's not always the case, but generally that's, if you can reduce one of those factors, then you can extend the life of the, of the reinforcement inside your reinforced concrete um, structure. So silanes are hydrophobic surface treatments. You apply them to the surface and they come in, de depending on your application and the location, you might choose a different type of makeup. So this top one is the cream type. It's uh, applied quite easily. And you would use that where, say you have a high wind, uh, wind environment. So if you've got a lot of wind and a lot of drying action, then you'd use something like that because you don't want the product that's supposed to be going onto the, the surface being blown away. And essentially the money gets blown away. So you'd use that cream type where the access is quite tricky or you, ne you need to apply in a short period of time. And then the other option is we have uh, lower, low, low viscosity or spray-on products. And those ones you, you could use when you have a large area to get get done quickly because it gives you the freedom of spraying uh, a much, much broader area. It chemically bonds to the surface of the concrete pores, so that still allows the vapor to come out. And it reduces that ingress of liquid and therefore those water-soluble chlorides and those aggress uh, aggressive chemicals. However, it's not much use for underground because water has got time to permeate through as, as a vapour, uh, as opposed to just repelling and being uh, dispersed. So the impregnations, the water can leave the structure, allowing it to dry out, and also you, you, you reach your designed concrete strength faster by drying out. Uh, and when you take the moisture out, it also slows or stops this, this phenomenon called the alkali silica reaction where you need moisture and, you, and, and it's depending on the aggregates that are inside the concrete, you might end up with this reaction, uh, which is an expansive reaction and can crack your concrete. So the goal of these products is to reduce the maintenance costs, essentially. You know, that's, that's really what to do is we want to cut the maintenance costs down for the asset owner. We want to extend the life of the asset so they can get more return on their investment and it gives them you know, some peace of mind without actually changing the look. You can apply it to concrete and it doesn't really change the look of it, but they have a protective layer or a protective system in place for their reinforced concrete. It's fairly easy to apply once you have access and once you, know, uh, once you have a good method in place. It can be either rolled, sprayed, brushed on. Um, and what's important is the porosity. We need to check that you get good uptake and that you get the right amount of product uh, or the right amount of active content onto the surface so that it can penetrate it. Um, you might have seen sometimes when you put a, a coat of paint on, it looks fantastic, but it's really thin. And generally, because it looks good, you try and stretch, stretch the coating out, but you don't get the full performance. Hydrophobics are the other way around. You have to put on the right amount of product so that it can penetrate. If you have enough product inside uh, your application to penetrate into the concrete, and set up that repelling um, action. So if you apply it properly, you'll definitely get less maintenance and you'll get less occurrence of corrosion in the reinforcement at an early onset. It will also um, reduce the future dirt pickup. Um, in the city, this is quite important. We end up with a lot of airborne dust and dirt and street grime 
and it will stick itself to anywhere it can. So if we have these hydrophobics uh, on our surface, if it does happen to lay there and, and next time it rains, it should the rain should take those away. So it, it makes our structure or our building look a little nicer, uh, even inside a, a you know a city environment. And you can get up to 15 years protection without recoating. So a single application at quite an econom economical um, installation. The product is quite uh, reasonably priced per square meter. Installation is quite cheap per square meter. So it might buy enough time for that asset owner before they want to paint, or it might buy enough time that they want to sell in 10 years so they can put a 15-year treatment on and, and sell their asset on. But this beading effect is, is what we're talking about as far as the surface tension. Oops. So the surface tension is changed. It's down here. Um, so it doesn't allow the water to, to wet surface because of, because of the surface tension of, of the water molecule. So the products, the Thixo is the cream and the 705L is low viscosity. So these two products have about the same amount of um, active content, but it's the application that's different. So it gives you the option as a specifier and as well as a contractor to choose the same performance but for different situations. If it's an overhead situation, maybe you go with a thicker coating or the thixotropic version so that it's got time to sit and it's got time to work and it's not dripping everywhere. If you go for the lower viscosity and you want to spray it in some situations, a gust of wind comes, you know, it's, it's money blowing in the wind. So we really want to make sure we can, we can uh, get all the product into, into the concrete. Now, there are classes for the penetration of these products according to the European standard uh, for concrete repair and protection, EN 1504 part two. And we can measure those uh, locally. If you have a structure that you'd like to say, well, we want, to, we want the highest performance, which will, and we want to see that it's penetrating in, we can, we can arrange to, to do some trials uh, with with a team on site, and and you know to make sure that we're comfortable, we're getting the performance that that's needed. They are highly concentrated. They give a good chloride barrier. So when we say a chloride barrier, you know, predominantly we mean seaside structures where we've got sodium chloride, uh, airborne sodium chloride, waterborne, in the sea spray, and it's hitting our concrete structures all the time. So when we have uh, a sea, like a port or a jetty or a concrete building near the sea, often they're far away and nobody wants to really paint them and keep painting them. So this is a, usually a good economical way of giving some additional protection for that environment. And what it also means is that if there's some um, minor flaws in the construction, say the, the concrete beam looks like this, but the cage might have moved in placement and the 40 mm uh, coating of concrete give the life expectancy might have dropped down to 33. By applying something like this, we can can increase the theoretical performance of the concrete again. So we can say, well, now we've got something to stop it getting to the concrete before it can work its way in. So everything in the concrete reinforcement uh, protection is about the rate of penetration until it hits the reinforcement and starts that corrosion. And this in your concrete code is usually when it's designed for conc uh, cement and water cement ratio so that you can achieve the 20 years, 25 years, 50 years that's designed according to the code and according to the, the environment. So very good for bridges and long residual high life uh, structures, so high value structures. So if you have a high rise concrete building that they want to, that the owner wants to hold on to for, for a long period of time, even if it's getting on in years, this is still a fairly econo economical option to allow them to extend the life of that, that um, building. For reinforced concrete, the steel reinforced concrete structures, we also have options to try and return, if, if the corrosion has already started or we have a contaminated concrete where there's a higher risk of corrosion initiating, then we can put something like these uh, migrating corrosion inhibitors on the surface. Now these 
chemicals designed specifically to penetrate through to the concrete, uh, through the concrete until such time that they reach the reinforcement. And when they reach the reinforcement, they, they react. And that reaction will uh, pacify, pacify or create a passive layer around the reinforcement. And when we talk about a passive layer of reinforcement, when you first cast concrete against reinforcement, the high alkalinity, a pH of concrete, usually 12, 13, something like that, that high pH will instantly form a passive layer around the reinforcement. And that passive layer will stop immediately that reinforcement from corroding any further. And it will stay like that inevitably forever if it's not acted upon. So that's why we have such a good marriage between uh, reinforcing steel inside concrete in a high alkaline environment because the corrosion doesn't go. The reason the corrosion kicks off is because we might have a defect or a flaw or a crack and moisture and something's been able to get in and upset that balance in the alkaline environment. So when that balance is upset, we can apply a surface treatment to stop that from getting worse, and it will reform that, what we, we call it a ferrous uh, iron oxide layer. It's only about one nanometer thick or two nanometers thick. It's really thin. And it's very cost-effective for chloride and for carbonation. So if either of those are the attack mechanism for your reinforcement in your reinforced concrete structure, then this type of uh, migrating corrosion inhibitor might be a good option. So I've also got, um, so this product is only released in May this year, so probably the first ones to see it in Malaysia. Uh, it hasn't been released yet in Malaysia, but uh, it's good to see what's coming. So Seek Guard 5500 is the first biomass balanced concrete protective coating on the market. So this is an anti-carbonation coating. Oops. Anti-carbonation coating with crack bridging capacity and a decorative coating that you can apply onto reinforced concrete structures to reduce the risk for them while still performing sustainably. Hmm. No singing. So that's that's the uh, first time the ad's been shown here. <laughs> it's 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 a it really is about you know taking some existing uh, systems that we have in the marketplace and making them more sustainable, so that you can continue to enjoy the same application, but you get a more sustainable outcome and a higher performance. So we have inside Seeker uh, a concept called sustainability portfolio management or SPM, and what this means is that. If we want to introduce a new product in the space where an existing product is, and we want to do it for sustainable reasons, it's not enough. If we want to replace that product for sustainable reasons, it has to be better performance. So our corporate product engineers are tasked with taking already well-performing products, making them more sustainable, but making them better than they were. If they can't get the balance right, then they don't replace it. And it has to be against the best performer within the range. So we don't take it against the, you know, the outlier. It's against the best performer. We benchmark there, and then they are tasked to say, what things can we do in the process of pr producing this product to make it more sustainable, but giving the user a, a, a much better performing product. So Seeker Guard 550 is an acrylic. 
5500 acrylic definitely has uh, so we as part of the evaluation it has to be third party uh, validated as well it's fully elastic so we can uh, it can bridge cracks that occur after so after the fact good for concrete protection facade and concrete structures and with static or dynamic loads say a bridge structure or, or somewhere where you have a lot of traffic and it's certified according to EN 1504 for low uptake uh, and a barrier to CO2. So that means we can actually measure the concrete, depending on your concrete, we can actually measure the concrete cover equivalent uh, based on, on the, on the um, EN 1504 standard. So if you need to increase the co concrete cover equivalent, it's not replacing concrete. What it's doing is saying as far as carbon dioxide penetration, it would be as if you had this much more concrete. So it doesn't uh, doesn't change the structure. It just means that you you can calculate how much more cover you should have. So part of development of these new uh, SPM products is we have to have evidence, and so resource and circular economy. The dispersion is derived from 100% renewable, and the pails are 80% recycled content. So every little change that you can make along the way in developing a replacement product has to be investigated as, as part of the um, process. Has to be registered. So if we do get a, a result, then we have to go and register that so that it can be tracked and traced and proven. And then it directly contributes to two lead credits for your project. So it allows you to have a paint coating that you're going to paint anywhere, anyhow, but you could say, you know what, if we use this product, we can take that credit and we can say that we have a more sustainable option for our client. So a life cycle assessment is done according to the standards, uh, ISO 14040 uh, and EN 15804, and data used for the assessment from SECA, and as mentioned earlier, from our raw material suppliers and industry standards. And so for every thousand square meters you should save with a lower consumption, one truck, Napoli to Paris. <laughs> so it can be off, once you have the raw data, you can actually measure it against other uh, physical um, physical con contributions. But until you work out what the contribution is, you can't offset it. So you can get two, green, two credits for green buildings according to LEED, and that's the most widely used green building rating system in the world. Uh, it's based on reach, uh, and reach is really, really tough in in the in the um, in Europe. But we are starting there because it makes us work harder for a better result. So we have to have a better result for our customers, ulti and ultimately their customers. And then we have to have performance evidence. So we test in house, and then we pass it out to external for validation. So we get best in class regarding crack bridging with a lower consumption. So normally for a high crack bridging coating, you have to have quite a quite a thick uh, dry film thickness, usually around minimum 340 micron or something something like that. But we can reduce the amount that you need and still have the same crack bridging performance. So it means that you have you can use less material. So because of you use less material. You save time as well, so the, the client gets the benefit of, of the, the time saving, the contractor gets the benefit of the time saving, and less, less material. And because we test it with uh, green growth, so it's put into the lab or the culture to, make sh to, to test how it performs as far as moss or green growth forming on the surface, there's less maintenance, so long term, less cost for the client. We, we sometimes in, in our industries we can forget about the maintenance costs because we've walked away from then and we're on to the next project. But it's important we consider maintenance for the long or the life of the asset as opposed to the life of, of, of the project. The system build up uh, with, without a poor sealer. But you can use those hydrophobic impregnations as the as the first, uh, say primer, so that you have that double 
layer barrier is, again, you have the hydrophobic behind the coating. And then you can use any seeker pore sealer, so a, a leveling render, cement based leveling render to make it, uh, make it look nice. Uh, and there's an over the top of, of our repairs. And for the repairs, the new range of repair mortars are all under the SPM as well. So we have lower dust, lower w water required. So if you multiply, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but if you multiply the amount of water that you use in a bag of mortar, multiply it by the number of bags of mortar that might be uh, produced in a year, it's actually a considerable amount of water. So if we can reduce the amount of water you need, reduce the dust for the user, make the product perform better and have a better sustainable footprint, then it's a win-win for ev everybody in the chain. So outside structures subject to dynamic or static load. So car park, you know, if you're going to paint it anyway, maybe paint it with a with a higher performance product. So the value added for all owner gets the benefit of the of the building credits. It looks nice, it's a nice clean coating. The lower maintenance costs overall for the life of their building. And it's got a good uh, high durability. And that's related to artificial weathering. So we can put it into a test unit and accelerate its UV, um, UV exposure. The contractor, they save some time, they save material, and they also are starting to engage in their own sustainability journey you know, more often. The more often that they, they engage in their journey, the better they will become. And for the designer or, or the consultants, you, you guys, you've got good testing, best in class for crack, uh, crack bridging, and it will also align with your sustainability targets for your projects. Okay, so that's protecting the concrete structures. Any questions on, on the coatings or the hydrophobics or, or what options and on that before I move into the bonus, bonus round? Sure. Hold on to them, and we have a good uh, we have a good round. Okay, great. Okay, so the bonus round. Seek in three D concrete printing. Who's seen three D concrete printing? One. Not a bad spread. <laughs> Not a bad spread. Okay, so we may have seen it on TV or YouTube. Uh, we might have seen it in videos. Uh, it's not at the level that we want it to be yet. Should we just say that? But I'll, I'll give you a bit of an idea of how things are going around the world and how things are going with Seeker's approach to 3D concrete printing. So how does it actually work? It's a type of additive manufacturing, so digital additive manufacturing. We have a print head or a nozzle that's mounted on a robot arm or a gantry, and that print head or the nozzle is connected to a pump with a hose pipe. The components of the material are mixed. The mix is then pumped to the print head Lines are extruded on top of each other like a layered uh, print. And then additions or admixtures can be added to alter the properties of that mix as it's being extruded. So that's the basic concept of 3D concrete printing, similar to the little 3D, concrete, uh, 3D plastic printer you may have in the lab, but this is just on a larger scale with the intention to make it mainstream down the track. So the one component 3D concrete printing process, we start with design. So we take the object and it gets put into a software, a slicing software that will break it into layers. And then once those layers are broken down, we can tell the, the computer can tell the robot the pathway for those layers. We dose into the mixer and the water is added at a set um, percentage and at a set temperature it's mixed and then it gets pumped to the robot and then the robot extrudes it in layers and then we cure by air so it's quite a bit different to normal concrete so we need to cure normal concrete concrete generally with a we want to retain the moisture so for a high performance one component material for 3d concrete printing it has to be able to cure in air so that's the general process for a one component. So when you talk about one component, it's a powder, 
or a cement that we add water to. And and that's the total technology. We've done all the work and we've put it into a bag, just add some water. So this, the one component is called Secretrete 752, funnily enough, 3D. And this is the sort of results you can get with a one component product. And the printer is not as important. You can use this material, it's designed to work with virtually any printer. So if you're looking for a startup printer or somebody you know is looking for a startup printer, but they don't know where to get a material from, this material is available off the shelf. And then we have a two component or multi component. And this is where it gets really interesting because of the we're no longer limited uh, by by the restraints of form. We can now decide what we want it to look like. As far as performance of the materials go, the higher the aesthetic requirement and the faster you want to print with higher quality and higher performance, but obviously some added value to the final element is where the two components sits. So the two component is at the high end. The one component is about mid-range. So you might want to print off-site or you might want to print on-site and you want the ability for a reasonable cost material to give you uh, design freedom. And lastly, where the majority of the market wants to start moving is in house printing, where you take that program and you print the footprint of a house on top of a slab. It's still in its infancy. You know, there's probably maybe 100 houses globally that are printed now. But as it gains momentum, things will change. Things will come. Uh, standards will change. Materials will get better. Printers will get better. And the acceptance will come. <clears throat> so here's a reasonable speed. So with the two component material, we can print it up to one meter. Excuse me. One meter per second which is very, very fast. Uh, most one component material you will print for about 0.25 to 0.3 meters per second. So it's, it's much, much faster. And, it, and you can build because you're curing or setting the material as you're printing it. And as you can see, we go from a nice simple round structure. Now we start to put a little detail in, make a little seat. And it is enough time if you don't want the ridges showing, you can print the shape according to how you've designed it without formwork and smooth it and render it. So it allows you now to make some really nice design features without the hassle of trying to get a formwork right for your concrete. But it needs collaboration. We have to have interest from all parties. We need an owner or a client or the developer that says, I want some of that in my project. And then we need someone like you to design it and show them how, how great it can be. And then we need someone that can make the material, and then we need someone with a printer to print it. So it really is an across-the-board engagement to, to try and get an, uh, a positive outcome with 3D concrete printing. You know, It can't be just driven from one side. It has to be acceptance on all, all sides. So if you haven't seen, uh, uh, there's a couple of pictures in here which will show you what's achievable. So we can print bridges now. We can print bridges. This is the first house that's printed uh, by a company called Perry. Again, uh, it's it's printed, but they printed the shell. And then they cast regular structural concrete inside two lines of printed material. And that's generally how things are being printed, at the houses are being printed at the moment. The shell gets printed, and then the structural element inside. But if you move away from the structural, then it gets really, really interesting for the, for the time being. So we can print these internal furnitures, external columns, quite rapidly. So what do we need? For a one component ink, you need uh, either this robot on the right-hand side here or a large gantry with a X, Y, Z axis uh, capability. Now, the investment will depend on your business plan or, or the or the the outcome will depend on the business plan long term because they can be quite expensive or they can be quite reasonable um, depending on what you want to want to print. So that's a very large scale printer on the left that will, I think, print up to 7 metres high, 9 metres long. So it's, it's quite large. 
And the robot arm, you can see, you can just multiply around. If you were going to extrude those or cast those in concrete, it would probably take longer to set the formwork up than it does to print. Some examples, uh, this, this um, kind of wall printed with a one component material, air, air cured, that took about, uh, because it's slower, I think that took about uh, an hour and a half. And then you can see that it's ready to go. The wall is finished. So you can see the benefits straight off the bat as far as time saving. It uh, gives you a nice finish and it gives you the freedom to design it. Other examples, we can do outdoor urban furniture and sculptures with our one component. We can fin uh, print facade elements. Or you can even print hybrid. So the bottom half of that sculpture is concrete and the top half is uh, plastic. Still 3D printed. So if you kind of like the kind of like a hybrid of precast and 3D printing, you can print panels to make an interesting shape or a unique shape and then cast and then connect those together like like a traditional precast. Or you can print on site like hang on here. Like the construction 3D do, where they will print the pavilion walls, cast it a traditional slab, bring the printer on top, print the next floor, cast another slab, and they're going up to three stories on this particular pavilion. And the printer just sits in the middle. As far as labor goes, they have two people. And that they'll print each one of those walls. I think that took one day to print the walls in that, in that instance. Now the 2K may be more attractive. You need a, <clears throat> at the moment, it needs the larger scale gantry type printer. Um, we're still waiting on results to make sure that the robot arm can keep up because it, the gantry is quite f allows fast printing, whereas the robot can be a little slower. But it also needs this the special print head that allows you to accelerate the product at extrusion so you can set it quicker and build faster. And then you need an additional software to control that acceleration. And you need an additional software to control the speed of the pump to match the speed of the, uh, the print. So there's a little bit more to it with the two component. And uh, this this um, unit here is called what we, what we call a con conti mix, which is a continuous mixer. So the cement product is actually always being mixed and it's not setting until it gets to the nozzle. So it allows you to print in a continuous fashion. And this is what you can achieve. So nice detailed facade walls, nice furniture, urban furniture, stairs. You can put the print or the pattern inside the surface. Uh, large urban scape pots or seats, any design you like. Box outs, in a, for instance, if you're printing a box out inside the for your services, it's not going to float up like a traditional polystyrene or get crushed like timber, and it's set in there for for good, and quite cheap and quick to make. A, a practical example: these mushroom columns were were printed for a particular project, ten minute print time. So it is just the shell and it's just the form. But it means that they don't have to have stock or forms and labor force to install them. You know, if we have one operator, you might only print the, the columns that you need two days' time. Don't have to store them because they only take 10 minutes to print. And that's ready to move. And because you're only printing the shell, total weight is about 300 kg. And the material is not largely consumed either. So there's only, uh, I think, 300 kgs of yeah, 300 kgs of product in that per column, so you're not consuming a lot of ma actual print material either. Very easy to transport, and then when they get to site, traditional reinforcement tied to the slab. Services can be run up while they're hollow, as opposed to trying to figure out where they are inside a traditional concrete. And then a traditional connection, and you can see the conduit there to bring the services up. So this is by a company called Arfentranger. And if you go to their website, you'll see a whole lot of the really cool stuff they're starting to do. But what it can do is, you know, you can start to see 
other applications and you can start to see other opportunities to take 3D concrete printing and add it into, into your uh, design flair. You know, hey, we'll take this object, which I've imagined, I'll give it to the slicing software, and then we can print it. Just like that. Company in the US called Picus, again with uh, the two component system from Seeker. They're really focusing on this urban furniture. Unique, bespoke objects that don't take them long to print, don't use a lot of material, but because they are unique, they can charge a premium. So the business model for them is really about premium one-off object. Not a uh, not great deal of business for Seeker because there's not a lot of material. But as far as the applications go, you know, if you, oops, if you wanted to use one of these these sorts of shapes or designs for your entry columns, you know, there'll be a, a unique design for every single project without trying to form it in concrete. Still a traditional structure inside, but a really unique skin. And even these, you know, something as simple as an outdoor area. Every panel is bespoke. Every panel can match the previous panel without a new formwork. You can print three panels in the morning, print the balance in the afternoon, ship them to site. So now we can start to see the economies of the of the printing system. And another another company that's just starting to work with uh, councils. Just going around printing the, power, uh, the pot plants. Now, if you walk around the city and you start to count up how many pot plants there are, and start to count up how many seats there are, there's actually, you know, it makes a lot of sense that they can make every single one of those a unique design. They don't have to be mass produced anymore. We can tailor all the pot plants in this zone to look like this, all the ones in this zone to look like this, without, you know, without a huge increase in the cost because you don't have to change the formwork. It's literally keystrokes, and we've got a different design. So that's the 3D concrete printing, but what Seeker have also done is invested with Perry into this digital fabrication of reinforcement. So the robot now shapes the reinforcement. So it's all good and well to print something with cement, but if you can't get the reinforcement into it, you can't make it structural. So this robot is designed to work on the same basis as the 3D printing. Now we can print steel cage to suit the same contours. So it's still early, it's a startup, but uh, really exciting stuff as far as, uh, as far as the digital movement is going. Okay, any questions on 3D or we will leave those till the end? I've only got two slides for this. this this particular bonus round. So, uh, in answer to uh, the, the earlier question about the sustainability, part of that sustainability is also looking at ways that we can work with this construction demolition waste. And the red cover is, is a technology that, that Seeker have to deal with that and capture some carbon. So we take the waste from construction returned concrete or, or broken buildings, rather than landfill, we put it through the process. And the, the big issue with recycled concrete is it's very porous, so it absorbs a lot of moisture that you put into your concrete mix, so you have to allow extra water because of all this cement paste is not taken off. With Recover, it takes off all the paste and you're 95% back to a virgin state aggregate. So now you can put it back into the process and almost do identical mix design as if you just mined that material. So it gives you the advantage that you can use a recycled aggregate in the same mix design as a brand new aggregate. The byproduct is a, is a supplementary um, cement uh, replacement product which gets put back into the concrete, into the, we can, so that gets passed back to the ready mix providers as well as the sand. So those components we can take all back from recycled concrete and then we give them back to the producers so that they don't have to mine new. So about 30 million tons of concrete waste could be recycled every year. That's quite an astounding number. A 
Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much for the second session, of course, the bonus round as well. Exciting to see the uh, direction of 3D printing, I think, in particular. So let's have the uh, floor open. Can we have questions for our guest, Mr. Ruben Reeves? I think he'd be more than happy to take any more questions from the floor. Yes, we have one gentleman at the back. Uh, can we pass the mic and please introduce yourself? Testing. Uh, good day. My name is Julius Ong, uh, architect Julius Ong. Uh, I have uh, two questions, actually. Uh, the first question is, if you were to have a green roof, I mean, literally, you're planting greens on it, eventually, the roots will find its way to the, to the slab. Uh, does Sika has any product that you know, can prevent the roots from trying to dig in into a slab? Uh, so that, that's the first question. Or is there any product that can sort of kill the roots or <laughs> prevent the roots and stuff like that? Okay, so very, very short answer, yes. So the sanifal that uh, Mr. Lau, I think, was talking about earlier on is already tested for 30 years with root resistance. So inside a, a test block, according to a standard, they grow a tree, and then they come back and check it in 10 years, and they come back and check it in 20 years, and no penetration. So the roots from a tree can't, can't penetrate, so that, that has root resistance. Uh, there's also the same testing for liquid-applied membrane as well. So it, it, it's not a, it's, it, there is a, an actual test method for it. So yes, the, the PVC membrane is, is root resistant, as is the liquid-applied uh, systems that, that Seeker have as well. If you don't have the root resistance, you're right, they will find a way through, especially if you use, say, a, uh, a, a traditional uh, bitumen-based material. We sell bitumen as well, but not generally for greener roof because the welds can be quite, or, or the seams can be quite uh, inviting for the roots to get through. So they find that little piece and then they work their way through and start to open up the seam. But Sanifal, uh certified for root resistance, as is uh, Seeker Roof MTC which is the liquid applied reinforced system, so, and no, and no problem with green roof. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next question, uh, I have a three acre basement car park, which is leaking uh, about one feet of water. Uh, you can see that the slab, there's no hole or cracks in the slab, but you can literally see a stream of water coming in. Uh, what is the best uh, solution to fix this problem? Product-wise, yeah. Product-wise? Yeah, product-wise. Uh, what's the best solution to, to solve this? Okay, so it depends. There, there are a few options. Um, obviously, uh, pumping is one. You can just get the water out of there. Uh, but then you'll need to direct that water somehow, somewhere. Uh, you can inject. Uh, polyurethane under the slab, but it may push the water somewhere else. Uh, there's an option also, depending on how deep the basement is, to cast a new slab if you have head height. So you can basically install a new membrane system and cast a new structural slab on top of that with drainage. And what that allows is the water to still come up through the original slab, hit the drainage channels, and be directed to the pump. But as far as the finish, you still just see a structural slab. And then that waterproofing can be connected to a, a structural, basically the same membrane, new slab on the wall. Because if you don't treat the wall as well, the water just goes to the side and then comes back out again. So you really need to find where the water table sits at its highest and, and, and work that as your new, new high point and work everything below there. Uh, so the options are we can inject or you can create a new waterproofing system on top of the ex existing slab. It, it either way is quite tricky. Um, to get a reasonable result, injection is usually pretty good. Um, but you could chase it for a couple of years. As you stop it here, it pops up over there. Um, or you could, I mean, it's not, not a seeker product, but you could look at some external, um, exter new external drains to take that, moist, take that water away. You know, some some directional drilling along along the perimeter, 
and install some new drains so that the actual water doesn't build up in volume. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, we, we did, at the end of the day, solve it with injection. Okay. Just a few thousand <laughs> injections. Thank you. Yeah. I, I was thinking, is there any other uh, alternative? There's the barrier that you mentioned about. Yes. Yep. So that, I mean, we've done projects in a six, seven deep, a six or seven story deep basement before where past a new slab, but you do, you know, cow parks have already got a low height when they're below ground, so you lose maybe another 100 to 150 mm by the time you cast a new a new slab on top. So you really have to be considerate of that because you're not going to change the ramps unless they're on grade. And then when your the vehicle comes down on the ramp and hits a new uh, finished height, sometimes that affects the car on the beam so that you end up losing that space that they had before. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Question. You can just hire a seeker next time directly to solve the problem. <laughs> Sorry, can we get the next question from the audience? I, don't know, I thought the treaty was uh, very exciting. I mean, I think that's really the, some of us get um, quite thrilled at the prospect of just printing a house. You know, we design something, we print it out, and in like a week or two, it's ready. So I'm just wondering from Sika's point of view, where do you think the technology is going to go and how is it relevant to Sika uh, in the near future? So in the near future, and at the moment, our, our drive is with the high end and the middle. So the high end two component uh, bespoke objects for for columns for for that sort of decorative end. Um, the reason being is there's not enough uh, research and development and acceptance of 3D for structural printing yet. And then in the middle of that, we also have the one component, which is also quite interesting. So that's really where the focus of our business is. Uh, some of the printer manufacturers are focusing more at the, like you say, at the house building. Mm. Um, but from, I mean, my point of view, I, I come from a concrete construction background, and to print a straight wall makes no sense when you can cast a straight wall. So I think the printing for me, you know, if you're going to be printing houses, should be printing, you know, designed houses. That would be yeah. That would be very difficult to cast, you know, with nice sweeping curves and interlocking pieces. That would be right. really hard to cast because if it's just going to be printing square, then you might as well cast it square and and stick right. to your traditional methods, okay. I think. Um, but house printing is on a large scale uh, printer. There are still teething problems as far as the material goes because, um, you know, to have a high engineered product, it costs. So they want uh, everybody's looking for a low engine, a high engineered product, but the same cost as a low, low cost concrete. So you, somewhere in the middle, we have to find the balance between what the expectations of the market are in cost for for printing housing, and the material, and what the reality is of delivering a high performance material. Thank you. You know, you were speaking about high value structures. And you get the example of the bridge. Could you define a high-value structure? For the concrete protection? Uh, in relevance to your presentation just now. Yeah, sure. So a high, what we call a high-residual value structure. So it means that you want to get the maximum return on your investment, either through, I mean, for bridges especially, because right. of, you know they connect communities. So if you take away that bridge, the option is to build a new bridge. So you have to build a budget over the life of the old bridge before you can have enough money to replace it with a new bridge. So that's what we talk about, a long residual life asset like a bridge. And also, if you're building in the city, it's not that easy to replace a structure. So you want to get the maximum life you can out of, out of, that, uh, out of that building before, before you have to dem demolish it and then you have, uh, you know, have to put, take all those materials somewhere and, and replace them, which is going to be even more difficult in the future. So it's about buying time for these structures and buying as much time as is possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I was actually referring to when you said high value, or was it referring to specifically? It's a high value for the from the client's point of view. Okay. I mean, for yeah, us, it's the same amount of material, whether it's a high value product, a high value asset, or a low value asset. Okay. But uh, high value as far as the, the owner and the asset owner and the client is concerned. Uh, thank you. Can we have uh, any more questions from the audience? Maybe we can wrap it up another two or three, and then we can 
if you want to speak to him personally, then of course he'll be available after the session is over. Anyone else would like to? Yes, uh, gentlemen again. If you want to have any more solutions, please hire them directly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, I, I do. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, you talk about recover. You know about uh, recycling the concrete. Uh, is there a market for buying recycled concrete? Because you know, like bottles, Coke bottles. You know, you you trade it in, you get a, a cent or five, uh, five cents. Uh, because I I believe right now they all just go to the dump site and. And that's it, you know. Yeah, I mean that's the current philosophy. Uh, you know, if you're a landowner and you you don't mind having a big hole where they can pay you to dump concrete, then, then people just take the money uh, with with no recourse. Uh, as far as recycling concrete for benefit goes, I I don't know where that'll come. Um, it, it will definitely come where you know, urban mining is the new term, where we are going to be mining. Everything that we have used, you know, everything that we're using in, in our society, urban mine uh, will become a, an industry more. But I don't think it's there just yet for concrete. Uh, I, so that's why with the recover, we're able to, to bring back aggregates. Now, aggregates are scarce. So you're getting more scarce. And you can't just go down to the river and dig up a whole lot more stones. And you can't go to the beach and just dig up a whole lot more sand and then wash it to get the salts out and then dry it. So if we can take concrete that was going to be dumped, uh, will there be a cost to it? Maybe. You know, maybe it's in time the owners of the recovery plant will pay, uh, pay a demolition company for their concrete and say, OK, we'll pay you this much for the concrete because we can offset the sale of the carbon that we capture at the back end. So there's a, a clear margin or clear profit option for them. At the moment, I don't think there is, because it's much cheaper to just dump it in a hole somewhere. Um, but that's not going to be for very long. You know, that might be another 10 years, 15 years, and then and then uh, governments will start cracking down on that. Um, have you got a whole lot of concrete you want to sell? <laughs> I'll store up for another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great Thank question, you. actually. There's so much of wastage where concrete is concerned when the building goes down. It makes you wonder if we can do something about it. Urban mining. Yeah, 10 years more, we can collect a lot of <laughs> raw material. <laughs> and by then, the cost Quote of scoring it would be, would be prohibitive. <laughs> Quote unquote raw. Uh, can we have a couple of more questions? And I think we can wrap up the session for today. Would anybody else like to ask the last two one question? The gentleman in front, can we have a mic for him, please? Talk about application of the uh, material on concrete. What about application of this material on timber? Because um, if it can penetrate, as um, hydrophobic penetration that you mentioned just now, can it also be applied to, say, for instance, the timber? Because you have projects or resorts in um, on the seaside, and they turn to they're prone to rot because of the high silicate component. Um, salt, sodium inside the air. After a while, the timber tend to be kind of after five, six years. So is that is that something that actually a product uh, can be used to to apply to timber? You can apply it to timber, but most of the time, you know, when you're in that environment, uh, that they'll use traditional uh, preservation methods. Um, it's not so much the outside of the timber that that rots away. It's usually the inner core of those piers that will rot away. So sometimes it looks solid on the outside, but it's a hollow piece. And when you have those hollow pieces and you're not doing annual, uh, you know, doing regular inspections and taking a drill core sample to find out that you've still got a solid timber, you would get left with an option to replace the entire structure or you wrap it with a carbon fiber or a glass fiber sleeve and then you fill it with a, with a, with a cementitious grout and basically form it into a, a, new, a new column. Uh, if you apply hydrophobic to timber, there's there's no real standard for that, so we don't know how it would perform. And it would also depend on what type of timber. So, I mean, timbers being a natural product has a lot of its own uh, features, but it also has a lot of its own anomalies. Uh, concrete, we know because we've designed it to be, to be the way it is, so we know how it can, can perform and we can create a standard. 
Um, in the seaside environment, like I say, generally the, the timber will be using traditional methods for, of, of preservation. Another question is uh, related to natural material. Um, if you look at material, for instance, um, limestone and sandstone, they're really beautiful, but uh, they're very porous and quite difficult for them to be used as an external cladding for buildings because they tend to become dirty over time. Um, can you use the same application for, say, for instance, uh, sandstone by method of dipping or, or, or application on the facade? External. Some, some some sandstones, yes, uh, but some limestones have a reaction. Uh, so when you apply certain products to limestones, um, it will start to break down the limestone itself. So you you really need to do some trials and some long term uh, samples. But sandstones, uh, not not just uh, the degrading from the environment, they also suffer from wind wind abrasion. Is really the biggest issue for sand sandstone cladings. Um, the the other side is that you could put a coating on uh, on a limestone, uh, like a travertine type of finish. Sika uh, doesn't have a kind of product for a limestone and sandstone. We do, but it's it's not it's not the same hydrophobic. It's a different uh, surface treatment, a specific for uh, natural stone um, that that you basically sponge on or brush on when you're when you've done the installation, and and that will protect it and make it look shiny. That uh, these materials are quite pretty. I just uh, unfortunately you can't use them for external. So people tend to use them for interior finishes. Mm -hmm. But um, I've used one uh, stone, external uh, sandstone, but they don't weather very well. No. Here. No. And 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 that's part of the reason is that there's no structure in it, and and the wind is really abrasive to sandstone externally. Um, I mean, the, to to clad a building with a you know a nice Italian. Uh, limestone now was starting to become one less less attractive because of the cost, and two, it's not so. You know, when we were mining a lot, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we were mining a lot of granite, we were mining a lot of limestone, a lot of marble, and that was accepted. It's not so accepted to be taking so many resources uh, for the sake of a uh, cladding anymore, um, unless it's really, really high end. Um, but you know, it's it's still available, but it's just really expensive now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's okay for us to close the session unless there's one more question that anybody wants to ask. I've got one question. Is it possible uh, for me to ask one of my colleagues from Sika to just come up and do an introduction for, for Sika Malaysia so that you know sure. the faces of the people? Sure, by all means. I think we can end it that way, I think. Should we get, the, uh, can we get this person on stage? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, just before this person comes onto the stage, after that, the remark will end the program. Of course, we would like to thank our speaker here. Can we have a round of applause? For Dr. Ruben. Thank, thank you very much. For Mr. Ruben Reeves. And uh, as soon as we have the representative on stage, we will end today's session. Of course, I think you'll be around right now if you want to thank discuss you, anything in person. Yes, could you please come onto the stage, introduce yourself? Is this impromptu? Is this a surprise for you? Did you not expect this? <laughs> thank you. There you go. There's a couple you of slides. You look surprised, even behind the mask. Slides. Just, just so that you know, because I don't, uh, I don't reside here. This will help you to help show our team and show that they're here to support, uh, and and give you an idea of what's, what we can, where we can support locally uh, for for your projects in Malaysia. Sure. So I will not take uh, much of your time. So just go quickly. So before that, uh, just a quick introduction about myself. My name is Andy. So I think uh, some of you may know me. So I've been with Sika Malaysia for 15 years. So uh, I think uh, this is what we're going to just to let you know uh, who we are in Sika Malaysia and who are the person that you can look for uh, in your future uh, projects, uh, support that needed. So um, we have been in Malaysia, Sika Malaysia, uh, registered under Sika Kimia Syndrome Berhad for the last 30 over years. Right, so um, obviously we are ISO certified companies, and um, we have all together uh, six factories all over all over Malaysia. Okay, so this is basically uh, you can see uh, in most of the major city we have Sika uh, present. So if you uh, happen to have a project outside of 
uh, central regions. Basically, we have our sales office and uh, colleagues to support your projects, uh, including uh, in East Malaysia, uh, KK and Kuching. So, like I said, uh, six, factory, uh, six factories. Uh, so, we have our HQ in Nilai and we have a plant in Ipoh. Uh, we have a plant in Poklang as well, Senai, Kuching and KK. So, we also have five R&D facilities and labs. Altogether, Sika Malaysia today, we have uh, more than 300 employees and uh, numbers of approved applicators, as you all know, Sika, we do not undertake any supply and store contracts. So, we always uh, certify and approve our applicators. So, uh, uh, the numbers should be more than that. Huh? So, we have uh, more than 100 of us uh, approved applicators. So, for your projects, uh, I always encourage uh, you have to insist that, you know, for all the projects that you're using Sika products, you should always ask the contractor to submit uh, approved uh, certifications uh, letters from Sika. Okay, so um, I think we have touched about uh, a lot of sustainable solutions uh, today from uh, Ruben presentations. Uh, we do have uh, a wide range of uh, green uh, product solutions. Uh, obviously, uh, in Malaysia, most of the uh, green product that we are using is certified under Singapore Green Label products. And then uh, we have a very extensive uh, technical support uh, on the uh, on, on the site and off site as well. And um, our business setup is basically divided into a different uh, target markets. And uh, we are able to provide trainings uh, as well to you. You know, so if you are interested, <coughs> into our global support uh, with local engagement. Uh, as you can see today, uh, Ruben is here. So uh, this is one of uh, our strength, I would have to say. So we can always uh, utilize and capitalize our, our know-how from the regions. All right. So uh, just to give you a snapshot of, uh, you know, some of the product is locally produced and some we imported. So like mixtures, uh, waterproofing, mortars, flooring products. Most of the products uh, in a powder form is mostly produced in Malaysia because, you know, we are rich in cement here. So uh, other products like uh, some specialist products like sealants, uh, epoxies, membranes. Uh, we touch about some PVC membrane today uh, is imported from our sister company uh, within the regions. Okay, so these are the core team uh, of Sika Malaysia. So uh, we have my boss, uh, our GM, Mr. Gabby, based in Singapore. So we have uh, our GPT GM, so myself. So I'm head of building system for Sika Malaysia. So uh, I have my colleague taking care of sales. Uh, my role is basically taking care of product, product and technical side, uh, uh, covering a, di uh, a different target markets, uh, waterproofing, roofing, flooring, seal and bonding, and refurbishments. And uh, we do have distribution channel as well in Sika. So some of the products we actually, uh, uh, how to say, selling through the hardware stores. So not, uh, not all of the products, but uh, some common uh, products that you can see uh, is available in the hardware store. Uh, basically, we have a colleague covering the distribution sales, and I have a colleague covering uh, target market for building finishing, talking about tar sieve, talking about skim coat plasters, right? And then uh, I have my colleague, Miss Liu, uh, sitting right behind Miss Liu. So she is probably the most relevant person that you should look for because uh, she's our specification manager. Uh, with her, uh, we have a few more colleagues under her on, you know, uh, covering and servicing uh, architects and engineers. Right, so, uh, well, uh, some just a snapshot of some key projects. Uh, of course, uh, many, I mean, 2016, we have done uh, one of these very iconic buildings in Malaysia. So, for our, uh, for METI. So, uh, our waterproofing system is just uh, behind the composite panels, uh, behind the, the aluminum composite panels. So, these projects, it's a, uh, it's very challenging and yet it's very interesting as well. So it's done by RSP architects. So we actually, you know, make sure that our membrane sana field here is cladding the entire uh, facade, I would say, to make sure that the entire building is watertight. And then, of course, uh, we do some some key projects as well, uh, and for the dam, uh, for the infra projects. So we have our uh, solutions uh, mostly for uh, shockwave and uh, concrete solutions, right? And then, uh, of course, commercial jobs for basement, for foundations, for waterproofing, even car parks, you know. So uh, I came across a lot of these uh, car parks. This is a very interesting car park project because the system is sitting on the Holocaust slabs, as you know, uh, how Holocaust slabs reacts. So the clients, you know, so they want something uh, uh, 
uh, as a car park finishing and yet have to be watertight to the structures. So we do have this kind of uh, coating system and waterproofing system combinations to ensure that the entire structure is waterproof. And then uh, even Tower and see for large factories, uh, we do have solution as well. And uh, this is the one of the market or one of the few that uh, outside of uh, construction, I would say, yeah, we call uh, industrial. So we do have solution for industrial, for making buses, for making, uh, you know, uh, for car bonding, you know, so like no most of your our car in Malaysia, if you break your windscreen, I would say, so probably it's 70, 80 percent of your windscreen is bond by our ASC or Sika Flex 225. Yep. Right. So that's all for my sharing this morning. Thank you very much. Fire, fire protections. Fire. Okay. See? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Fireproofing. Yeah, we do have some <laughs> fireproofing. <laughs> Maybe you can. Uh, yeah, I might be able to elaborate a little on that. So for steel protection, uh, fire fire coatings. So intermittent epoxy coatings. We had a a brand called uh, Seeker Unitherm. Uh, earlier this year, oh, actually, earlier this year, the divestment of the industrial coatings, which included the fire uh, protective uh, epoxy, uh, was completed. So that division of our business has been sold to Sherwin Williams. Uh, we still have fire protective mortars for protecting concrete and for protecting carbon fiber um, installations but uh, not for steel protection anymore. We used to have the direct, um, the directly applied to the steel members at fabrication and then arrived to site pre-finished. But uh, that's part of the divestment of the, 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 uh, the industrial coatings of Seekers business. So we no longer have that available to offer, unfortunately. Great, great question, thank you. Okay, right, thank you so much. And I guess that question uh, pretty much marks the end of today's program. Once again, let's take this opportunity to wish both our presenters um, thank you so much and give them a round of applause. And thanks and to Vishal. And of course, we would like to... Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Vishal. Well, thank you. Great job. <laughs> wow. Very much appreciated. It's the first time I think a speaker has thanked me on, on stage. <laughs> always uh, pleasant to, to be appreciated. And of course, till then, we'll be having another series uh, very soon. Till then, have a safe trip back home. Remember the hashtag Kita Jaga Kita. Have a pleasant day ahead. Thank you so much and we will uh, see you soon again.